Hey everyone, Skull902 here, and after missing out last year, I want to do something for Halloween. Plus, it's been a while since I did a proper video. So to that effect, let's talk about my favorite horror franchise, Scream. Created by a down-on-his-luck scriptwriter with a love of horror in the mid-1990s, the original movie was a game-changer in the horror genre and was the start of an entertaining series of films. Compared to other slasher franchises like Friday the 13th, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and most of the Halloween movies, Scream is something of a rare gem in that its overall quality is actually really good. Seriously, I don't think there's a bad one in the bunch, and I'm going to talk about why. Forgive the screenshot collection, they're there more for visual appeal as I ramble, not so much to fit in with the things that I'm saying. The first movie is a great introduction to the world and characters of this franchise. In it, our protagonist Sidney Prescott has been dealing with the death of her mother Maureen for the last year when a string of killings begins in her small town of Woodsboro. Complications with the relationship she has with her boyfriend Billy Loomis, as well as the killer taunting and attacking her over the next several days, culminates in a house party hosted by her friend Stu, where it's revealed that not only Stu was involved in the killings, it was masterminded by Billy as a revenge plot for her mother's affair with his father, causing his mother to leave. The film does so many great things here, like the excellent twist on who the killer was by having multiple red herrings, seemingly killing one off and then revealing it was a two-man job. But it also introduces us to an interesting set of characters, with Sidney just trying to live a normal life, Billy's unsettling nature, especially after the reveal, Stu being completely wacko, Phil Nut Randy and his rule set for horror survival, Dewey's honest nature, and Gail starting off as a bitchy and sensitive reporter but redeeming herself in the end. Like I said, the film was a game changer too. It poked some fun at the horror genre and slasher flicks in particular with its tongue-in-cheek references and uses of black comedy, and did some ballsy things like killing off Drew Barrymore's character Casey Becker in the opening scene after having marketed her more or less as the star of the film. I first saw this as a video rental from Blockbuster when I was eight, and that late night watching it was a real treat. The last shot before the credits still sticks with me after all these years. It felt like the perfect way to conclude the movie. Scream was fantastic as well as groundbreaking, and the film's overwhelmingly positive reception made sure a sequel was soon to be made. Sometime after the first film, Sydney is now attending college with Randy, having made a new boyfriend in Derek and a close companion in her roommate Hallie. All is seemingly well until the couple gets killed at the premiere of a movie, called Stab, based on what happened in Woodsboro, kicking off another series of murders. Dewey and Gale come back to respectively talk to Sydney about it, where it's revealed that there's some tension between the two after Gale's book about the Woodsboro killings. Gale also tries to reunite Sydney with Cotton Weary, who was convicted of murdering her mother Maureen but was exonerated after the details of Billy and Stu's actions came to light. Meanwhile, another reporter, Debbie Salt, is keeping tabs on the new killing spree. After the deaths of Randy and Hallie, the killer chases Sydney down into a theater. Revealing himself to be Derek's best friend Mickey, he kills Derek and says he's looking to get caught in order to become famous, the center of attention of a media mob for committing such a crime. It's then revealed that he got help from Debbie, who Sydney recognizes as Billy's mother, Mrs. Loomis. Debbie's motivation was simply revenge for Sydney killing her son despite his actions. She then shoots Mickey and fights with Sydney before Cotton turns the tables. Mickey and Mrs. Loomis are killed, Dewey is revealed to be safe after Debbie attacked him and Gale the night before, and Cotton and Sidney seem to somewhat settle their differences. It was a real toss-up for me over whether this or the first was the best film in the series, but I think I'm going to have to give it to this one ever so slightly, which surprises me a bit considering I saw it the least out of the original trilogy. But I think the cast and their dynamic all works toward this film's quality just a teensy bit better. We again have multiple red herrings, but I think they did a great job making it even more of a mystery who the killer would wind up being with Cotton's inclusion in the story, plus the first movie survivors, now experienced, get to show off their full potential in a situation like this, which is a great show of character growth. Combine that with the series' familiar meta sense of humor, and we've got ourselves yet another classic. Cotton Weary, now a nationally famous talk show host, is driving home when he gets a phone call. It soon takes a turn for the worse when the caller reveals he's been stalking Cotton's girlfriend in their house. After failing to gain information on Sydney's whereabouts, the stalker kills them both. Sydney, as it turns out, is living a life of isolation, now out of college and working as an over-the-phone crisis counselor who's been starting to feel the effects of PTSD, frequently hearing her mother or having nightmares about her. This movie is more so about Dewey and Gail, who tried to settle down after the second film before Gail couldn't take the small-town life. They meet again in Hollywood where the troubled production of Stab 3 is further complicated by the killing of its cast, which started with Cotton. 
After the killer taunts her over the phone, Sydney travels to Hollywood to work with detectives on the case. More cast members are killed before the remaining ones, along with their director, Roman Bridger. Dewey and Gale meet up at the mansion of the movie's producer. The killer makes his move, picking off more of the cast until holding Dewey and Gale hostage as a means to get Sydney to the mansion. They get into a brief scuffle before Sydney's lured into the home's private theater, where the killer unmasks, showing it was Roman behind the killings. He reveals that he was actually behind it all. Conceived during Maureen Prescott's short tenure in Hollywood, he tracked his mother down only to be rejected by her. Discovering her adulterous ways, he convinced Billy and Stu to kill her before the first movie, becoming the director of the events that followed. He took his rage out on the film industry by killing people involved in it, and now he only had Sydney left to finish the job. They fight, Dewey and Gale catch up to them, and Dewey ultimately puts an end to Roman. Afterward, Dewey and Gale get engaged, and Sydney is shown to have let go of her past, living a life in the company of her friends without any fear. Like I said, this was the first one I saw, having gotten a VHS copy of it when I was seven. For nostalgic reasons, it is still my favorite of the films, but it has its flaws, like how some of the killings really relied on convenience, Roman's reveal lacking some impact since he had never met Sydney prior to that point, not to mention his death, and the level of detail in his voice changer box. Like, I refuse to believe that was Maureen's exact voice. Sydney's PTSD must have had something to do with her perception of it. But it still has enough of the same feel with its soundtrack and humor, along with otherwise good writing to make it a good film. Not as solid as before, but it works. Now a published author, Sydney returns to Woodsboro to promote her new book. Shortly before then, two high school students were murdered by a new ghost face. Evidence is found in Sydney's car, meaning she'll have to stay in town with her teenage cousin Jill as a suspect. Dewey and Gail have disagreements which cause them to investigate the case separately. Dewey is the sheriff of the police department, and Gail employing the use of the high school film club to get some possible leads. After another couple of murders, the film club goes ahead with its plan to marathon the stab films at an event that nearly costs Gail her life. Afterward, Jill's friends gather an after-party at her friend Kirby's house, where killings closely resembling ones from the first movie take place after Sydney arrives. Jill is revealed to be Ghostface, with the awkward Charlie as her accomplice. She says her motive was jealousy after the attention Sydney got in the wake of her surviving all the attempts on her life. She then betrays Charlie, killing him, and says that she intends on being the sole survivor in order to gain the attention she always desired. She fights with Sydney and wins. In the hospital, Jill is informed that Sydney survived the attack and she attempts to kill her before she can tell the truth about what happened. Gail, Dewey, and one of his deputies, named Judy, try to intervene to no avail. Jill holds Gail hostage before being killed by Sydney with a defibrillator and a shot to the chest as reporters outside sing Jill's praises, yet to know the truth about the situation. In a post credit scene, Dewey, Gale, and Sydney share a laugh as the latter is shown to be recovering fine. I do think the film is good, but I also think of it as the least of the four. Something seems a little off about it, as if the people behind it were rusty. Which makes sense considering how long it had been after Scream 3. I'll give you an example. Billy and Stu looked conceivable as the killers in the first movie, while Jill and Charlie I think barely have it here. Jill way more than Charlie, who damn near looks like an elementary school child. Still, we get some interesting stuff like Sydney being a suspect this time, Dewey and Gale dealing with the troubles of their relationship, Gale's creativeness when dealing with her own investigation of the events, as well as the ending in the hospital. Plus, as a Metro Detroiter, I got an absolute kick out of seeing WDIV anchorman Devin Skillian as one of the reporters. It still had the referential, tongue-in-cheek tone, like with the double subverted beginning of the film, our main trio of characters are just the way we remember them, and it manages to work itself into being a fitting sequel despite its shortcomings. Overall, I think the Scream series is fantastic, if you couldn't already tell. I think that it's mostly well-picked cast, particularly the main players who got time to develop over multiple films, alongside the best choice for director, its self-referential humor, setting, characters, look, and score give it a unique style that I don't think has been replicated. It's a smart series with a real knack for nuance and subtlety, like how the dime a dozen Ghostface costume meant literally anyone could be committing the murders, the killer in Scream 2 taunting Randy about never getting to be the star when you consider Mickey's motivation, the way you can tell the difference between the killers who are working together from the way they carry out their actions, or how each of the movies has Ghostface use the phone differently. Thanks to Rabbit for pointing that one out. Scream was my gateway into horror, particularly slasher flicks, and I think it was the perfect series to do that, at least for me personally. Plus that costume, particularly the mask. It's still my favorite among all the famous slasher icons. Wes Craven was right on the money by using that one. It's a series I love, well, to death, and I hope that the upcoming fifth movie can continue the trend, if not improve on it.
That'll be enough gushing from me for now. I've been Skull902, thank you for watching and have yourselves a happy Halloween.